Welcome back. It's been a little more than a month since Super Freakonomics hit bookstores, and by now you've probably already heard that its publication has set off a bit of a firestorm, particularly on the subject of climate change. Co-author Stephen Dubner and Stephen Levitt argue that, that focusing the world's attention on diminishing carbon use is not the best way of solving global warming. And they advocate a potential solution involving shooting sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere, which could have a cooling effect on global temperatures. The book, it's number four on the New York Times hardcover nonfiction best seller list and Stephen Dubner is here now to talk about this ongoing controversy and also some broader issues that uh, his now second book brings to light. Thanks a lot for coming in to join us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So with this chapter on climate change you guys seem to have, uh, to have really stepped in. Are you, do you have any regrets about uh, about that chapter? Uh, no. Only The only regret I think I, we have is that where we describe that the movement to stop global warming sometimes has the feel of a religious movement. I think we should have emphasized that even a little bit more. It's now that you've gotten the reaction yeah. that you've gotten. Yeah, I mean, I can't say it's that surprising. Basically, our problem is we don't represent the vested interests here. The vested interests being those who argue for strong government activity in terms of carbon mitigation. Um, and basically we're saying let's take a look at the problem as it exists. The issue is this, if the problem is a big enough problem to be really worried about, which we argue it may be, there's a great deal of uncertainty, it's hard to say, then the solutions that are now being proposed, i.e. stop burning all carbon fuels as soon as possible, won't work. The reason it won't work is A, it's very, very costly, which we know. B, it's very hard to get people to change their behavior, especially when it goes against their economic self-interest. But thirdly is the science doesn't seem to suggest that that's a good solution. In other words, mitigating carbon probably would be very ineffective at stopping warming if warming gets to be dangerous. Well, I gotta, I gotta stop you for a minute, and I have to bring up some of the critics that have mm -hmm. talked about this. Um, the New Republic, for example, said that you and your co-author just parachute into the field of climate science and offer some lazy punditry, no original research, just garden variety ignorance. So, I mean, I have to ask, why should we uh, buy this argument in terms of, of I, I how would to say, fix the problem? I would say somebody should actually read what we've written rather than a New Republic review that accuses us of lazy punditry and doing no research. There's a ton of research in it. Um, one issue is that some critics, some climate activist critics got a hold of the book before it was published and didn't seem to realize that there was actually a, an entire section of endnotes which cites all the scientific papers. We cite papers from the IPCC. We cite papers from various climate scientists and astrophysicists. We talk to climate scientists and physicists and a variety of people, including engineers who, who kind of are working toward geoengineering solutions. Let me also just say, the whole idea of spritzing the atmosphere with uh, sulfur dioxide seems entirely repugnant and seems insane. And we, we acknowledge this in the book. The point is this, if the problem gets bad enough to do something about, well, don't you want to have something to do? That effort, called kind of a strata shield, they call it, the idea of that is to essentially mimic nature, which is what happens when a volcano blows, right. a big volcano blows. So. People are very, very emotional about the topic. It's a lot of fun for people to lash out. And when they disagree with you, as we disagree with kind of climate activists, to say that we don't know what we're talking about, we misrepresented data. I, I stand by the chapter 100%. I'm just curious. I mean, my first sort of reaction when hearing about that potential solution was, to think of someone who has a disease, for example, like diabetes or heart disease, yeah. and say to them, well, just take medicine, but don't cut back sugar or don't cut yeah. back fats in your diet, which in this case, don't try and eliminate it at the source, but rather eliminate it once it gets, or, or mitigate it once it gets to the atmosphere. So yeah, but it's also not a zero-sum game. To do one doesn't mean that you don't do the other. So our point is this. The markets are working really hard toward better energy. Better energy. No one in their right mind, well, I shouldn't say no one in their right mind, but there are probably a few vested interests who are very, very happy. With it. But if you look at the biggest energy companies are among those who are working hardest on new energy. We want new energy. We need new energy. We'll get to new energy. The point is this. Do you want to, as of today, stop Mm -hmm. the way we use energy and adopt a different solution. So it's just kind of a different way of looking. We're disinterested. We're not making an argument that government should do X, government should do Y. We're saying if warming gets bad enough to where it's a big problem, then you probably want to have a solution in your pocket that can help save the world. And, th and this is, we entertain a variety of those solutions. Um, I'm curious too, sort of your process. When you look at the book and the last book, Freakonomics, mm -hmm. and the sort of esoteric menu of um, items that you guys talk about, how do you arrive at that? I mean, do you look for things where there's a consensus and try and figure out 
other ways to look at it? Do you have a list of things? How, how does it work? Um, a little all of the above. Um, a lot of things we do are upset the apple cart on conventional wisdom. So whether it's global warming or some health care things we write about in the new book or prostitution, even the economics of prostitution, it's not really so much that we look for things to turn over. It's we look for areas that haven't been examined with an economic approach. And what I mean by the economic approach is essentially taking the tools of economics that are usually applied to the macro economy, which we don't do. We don't write about the markets, inflation. No, basically, everybody who watches this program, we don't do anything that actually benefits any of them at all. We take the tools of economics and apply them to different topics that haven't been looked at in that way. So the tools are using data instead of emotion and opinion, looking for correlation and not mistaking it for causality, but trying to establish causality and things like that. And then we apply it to things like, you know, a global warming, a prostitution, sumo wrestling, whatever the case may be. Well, you said that anybody watching this isn't going to benefit from this, but are there ways that you can sort of apply this to investing into specific situations? Yeah. I uh, yes. I mean, obviously, people are using economics when they're yeah. looking at investing, but th in this micro way. The short answer is yes, but we don't do this. We do spade work, but we don't actually have the list of here are 10 things you want to do as an investor tomorrow. What we do is we kind of show that human behavior is, or economic behavior at least, is very much a response to incentives. Okay, we all know this. Everybody learned this at some point along the way but you kind of forget it. So it's not that people are bad or good, it's not that people are greedy or generous, it's that people are people and they respond to incentives and what we try to do is walk up to any given circumstance, whether it's investing or charitable contributions or whatever it may be, and tease apart how the incentives work. Often incentives are hidden, so you need to figure out who is getting what out of what and then use data to answer the problem. So we do write about a lot of things that if you're an investor, yeah, there's a lot to gain from. There's a lot to gain from knowing how to leave your emotion out of it. We write a story about an economist who, believe it or not, taught a colony of capuchin monkeys mm -hmm. to use money to see how they spend it. Right. And he was trying to look at the parallels between them and us. Turns out that those monkeys are very loss averse. They respond more emotionally to loss than they do to gains. Turns out, however, that other economists who've done similar studies have found that human day traders are similarly loss averse, which is a sign of irrationality. So once, you know, everybody wants to fix or solve some problem in some way, our argument is before you rush off to do it and spend your money and resources doing it, know what the problem is on the ground. Use data to figure it out. So we just have a, a few seconds left here, about 30 seconds. Do you think, for instance, in the media that covers the business world, that we pay too much attention to the bigger picture and don't look at, at this the kind of economy. data? Um, I do, but I'm probably biased in that regard. The, <laughs> the problem with macro is it's such a big, complex, dynamic system, it's really hard to get a beat on it, and human psychology plays such a big role. What we right. do is different. We look at micro, applied micro, where you can actually describe human behavior with data. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Thanks a lot for coming in. Really appreciate it.